The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning and welcome to any visitors here that have come to worship with us. Uh, we are kind of life without Peter for me, kind of feels strange if you're visiting. We just spent a few years studying first and second Peter and finished up two weeks ago. So if you'd like to come talk about those epistles, come see me. I'd love to buy you coffee. <clears throat> Congratulations uh, to the Hatters, uh, uh, the Whitford family. They were married here yesterday, and it was uh, a beautiful celebration. And then the Olsons on Monday. I wanted to kind of give you a lay of the land then for the next five weeks. I get a freelance since we finished uh, Second Peter. So whatever the Lord kind of leads, uh, I, I just get to follow that leading. And so I ask that you pray that it would be fruitful. The Lord would guide me to the right areas in shepherding the flock of God. Uh, then my 10 years is up. Uh, we take sabbatical uh, every 8 to 10 years, I believe it is. And so mine's going to be in the middle of August. And while I'm gone, we're going to study Habakkuk for four weeks. And then the I am statements in John uh, starting this fall. Um, so that'll be a rich season together. I look forward to what God will do uh, during that time. Well, this morning we're going to look at the church. I've entitled this A Bride That Any Bridegroom would love. I love the church of God. I've given myself to serve it for the last 30 years, and it it is literally, it's kept me in the faith. It's caused me to grow, and it's served my family very well, the the body of Christ. And so this morning, I get to preach on the church, and it's a living, vital organism. It's, It's God's life in us together, and it was predestined and planned before the foundation of the world. It was bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you want to talk about value? Purchased by the blood of Christ. He inhabits it even this morning. He purifies it. He empowers it. And he puts his glory on display from the bride of Christ. It's what the gates of hell will not overcome. And Jesus declares, I will build my church. And we have been brought into that by the grace of God and the grace of God alone. And I just don't think we love the bride enough. God's instrument to bring about His glorious plan. And it will exist for all of eternity. It's going to be a bride made perfect and going into glory then forever. And so I I pray then, let's uh, go before our God and pray this morning that we would love His bride and we would understand it, function rightly, and draw from it what God has designed. So let's go to our God for such a thing. Father, I come before you and I thank you, Jesus Christ, that you purchased this bride with your own blood, your own life of righteousness. And so what a treasure to have people from every tribe, tongue, nation, God be gathered together uh, in one, in Christ. And so I thank you for this bride. I thank you for your design and how you want to use it in the advancement of your kingdom I pray that your spirit would move this morning through this word and that everyone in this room would come to behold the truth of it and that their hearts would be given to it and their will would follow your command. And so God, let no one miss what you have for them here this morning. And so do what no human being can do, God, and come move in power at Southside Bible Church this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to look at the doctrine of the church this morning, going to give you kind of a primer on its glorious design by God. But first, by way of introduction, I just wanted to share my personal testimony of my journey with the church. I was birthed into it in 1987. And I was so excited, Uh, I dug in with all of my heart. It uh, it was everything to me, and I started groups, and I just served anywhere and everywhere. I think I got 200 moves in my first two years of being a Christian. (laughs) I was just so blessed to be in the colony of the saints. And as time progressed, I realized everybody didn't share my new affinity for the bride of Christ. They told me, don't worry, son, you will settle down and get over this. And, and then I got in and started seeing the scars and, and warts in the body of Christ. And I found many who were more concerned about appearance than growth, the getting in and growing in Christ. And then God called me to seminary 
And I wanted to serve her the rest of my life as a pastor. That was my, my calling and desire. And I went there and I began learning through a fire hose and I just drank and drank up every class I could possibly take. I sat under some of the best preaching in the whole world. On Sunday mornings and Sunday nights, I just have goosebumps sitting, listening to Dr. MacArthur explain the Word of God verse by ver verse. But I had very little body life. I just had sermons, and then I would go back home and start studying Greek and Hebrew and crazy things like that. But I had a very, uh, I wasn't growing the way that I should have. And then I graduated and planted a, a church in Denver, Colorado, across from East High School. And, and we were so committed to expository preaching and declaring the whole counsel of God. And I was just wrestling with my soul in the Word of God to grow and, and deepen but most of my wrestling was alone in my office, except uh, with the Puritans, I had very little body life, just books. My kids were young, and we just struggled through that season. It was a very lonely time for my wife. Seven years later, we planted Southside Bible Church, which is over 20 years ago now. We had a commitment to expository preaching and sound doctrine, but the focus was going to be more on the, on the emphasis of Jesus Christ and what He has done, and we needed more fellowships, and we were going to start fellowships and evangelism, and, and uh, missions would grow later. I, I grew up in an area where I never knew what missions was, and I needed to, to grow in my own thinking in that area, but I just saw in Acts 2.42, they were devoted to one another, and they broke bread together, and I knew that had to be a part of the church. <clears throat> but there was still something I just wasn't getting. Fellowships are, are what Christians do, and, and that's all I understood. And potlucks, are they got to be in the Bible somewhere. There's just nothing more biblical than a potluck. But there was still something missing, something missing. We were going in the right direction, but I knew there was more. And really, the, we, we just kind of had one gift in the church. If you had the gift of teaching, everybody else came, heard teaching, and then went home. And then came my study in Ephesians. And a light came on that I knew doctrinally, but I didn't get experientially. And it was this section that we're going to look at this morning that God just lit a fire in my heart. Everything that I had been learning was just moving in this direction. I had come to see that the fulfillment of the law was to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And I'm just being lit up with that truth. And now all of a sudden, here's how that's going to function. I learned what God wanted the church to be. What was His design? I realized how much I had been missing it and how much the church at large had been missing it. And we had become preaching centers or social, social activism centers, and we weren't doing what Ephesians 4 is going to say this morning. There's more to it than just those, but those are going to be a part of it. So I want to share with you this morning for you to enter into the fullness of the joy that I have found in His bride, and so that we as a local assembly, Southside Bible Church, would bring much glory to God and not just do church and, and never hit what God intended for this to be. There is so much more. And this is so easy to happen where you just come and you never enter into what God designed. And some of you do it every Sunday morning here at Southside Bible Church. And I'm just praying that God might do something powerful uh, in our lives and hearts here this morning. There's something so much more beautiful what God has designed the church to be. And so as I began pondering this sermon and thinking, our enemy is so crafty. The power of the Christian life, you will see, is a church functioning rightly uh, joined to Jesus Christ. It's a living organism that we are in vital union with Christ. His power then, by His Spirit, is flowing through us. And as it flows through us, we are to mature and be built up into the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are dependent upon Him, and we're dependent upon one another for this glorious reality to take place. So I don't think there's a message more needed in the church of America and to exhort our hearts again this morning, because we're fighting our culture, and we're fighting the church on what we will look at this morning. And since the 80s, the church has become a consumer product 
where you come and say, what can the church do for me? And I want this and I want that. And we pick all of these things and it's for the masses and it just fits our individualism of our day. And we're in such danger with this generation who can't even talk or fellowship without a phone. We're all just in isolation with tablets and all these things, and it's brought about a spiritual immaturity that we're going to look at this morning that I'm just asking God to break down walls in any mind or heart here this morning. The fruit of all of this is just so simple, is what is the church to the masses? It's a place where you go to sing and hear a sermon and go home a place to go and connect with people of the same age and same place of life. And if you're real committed, maybe even go to Sunday school, and that is your understanding of church, which is so far from what we're going to look at this morning in Ephesians 4. I met with a young man a couple weeks ago, and he was converted by watching the church be the church here in the last month at Southside Bible Church. There is a power when the church functions the way God has designed it that will make people say, what is this? Tell me about your Christ. And so what we are looking at is the power of evangelisms and missions and for us to grow up into the head. And so I just want to look with you one more time then Ephesians chapter 4. And as we look at Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to start with a big picture of the goal or God's design for the church, and then we'll narrow it in and some specifics that we will look at this morning. So I have an outline. Uh, I'm a little nervous. It's seven principles to establish unity in Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. And I'm still on the introduction. So we're going to get there. <clears throat> but if you want to pop that outline up, the first point then is the context of our unity. I want to look at the big picture. And as we begin, I just want to make a very simple observation. Ephesians 1 comes before Ephesians 4. <laughs> and you pay me to see these kind of things. Isn't that brilliant? <laughs> wow. You don't start with unity, which is where everyone in the church today is trying to start. We got to have unity and we got to work together and, and figure it out. And, and we're going to come up with unity somehow. It's like tying a cat and a dog together and saying, unity, <laughs> it doesn't work. You need Ephesians 1 through 3 if you're ever going to get unity. And so in Ephesians 4, 1, it starts with my favorite word, Therefore, therefore, in light of one through three, now we have our commands and how we're to live our lives. And so the Christian church is not just a bunch of nice people. It's a group of new people. It's a people in Ephesians 2 that were dead in their trespasses and sins, and God made them alive together in Him. He raised us up and gave us spiritual life. The life of God is now in you. His Holy Spirit has been planted within you. You are brought into the Trinitarian love of God. You have His Spirit. You have the greatest unity there's ever been between the Father, Son, and Spirit. And we are brought right into that unity, everyone who comes to faith in Christ. So he says, you were elect before the foundation of the world. Christ came and He redeemed you. And the Holy Spirit has sealed you, guaranteeing your salvation and coming in to Him. You are one with Christ, you're joined, and everyone who believes is joined together in Christ. Him as the head, and we are the members of His body. Unity. Unity by the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel can do what nothing else in this world has ever been able to do. Our world is trying so hard to bring unity, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And this is the only way that we will ever find unity, and it's in Ephesians 1 through 3 in Christ Jesus. So you are brought into the church. What is the goal of the church? Why did God make it? What is its function? Look with me in Ephesians 4.11. <clears throat> What's its function? He gave some as pastors some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. That's in the singular. And so it's, it's not all of us becoming mature men. It's, it's this picture of a body and all of us together building up each other to become this mature person, this one body in Christ, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. 
And so the church is to, to be built up and matured into Jesus Christ. We're to grow up into Christ's likeness. That's the design and the goal of the church, that, that we would be growing and maturing into Christ's likeness. And so the church was designed for us to grow. And it's so beautiful because God made a place divinely structured for us to mature. Here's his gift, local assemblies. And it's, it's given so you will grow. And it's like what we saw at the end of Peter. Peter taught us, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Paul has now taken that. He gave you the Spirit. You got everything for life and godliness to grow. And now he takes that and he drops it in the middle of the ecclesia, the church, and he says, it's a community project. I've given you life in Christ. I've given you my spirit and my word, but I've given you the body of Christ. I'm sticking you in there and I've designed it for you to grow into Jesus Christ's likeness. So what it tells us, we're born infants. We come into this world as little born infants and we are immature. And we need the body of Christ to grow. And if we stay outside of it, we stay immature. We need the body of Christ to grow. And so Paul is saying that we need the church if this is going to take place. We need each other to no longer be children. We'll remain infants if we stay outside of it. And it's so common today because the church is not functioning the way God designed it that I can meet people who have been Christians over 50 years and they're just immature all my friends from seminary, when I talk to them, what we're crying out for is older, mature saints, men and women. We can't find them. Praise God, we're loaded with them here. But in many churches, they're saying we can't find people who grew up and matured in the church anymore. And that's because we abandoned what we're going to look at this morning. And Paul tells us what the goal is as a mature man for the whole church, that that would be what is manifested by all of us. And so you get into the body and you grow up and you become like Christ. And, and so, guys, the name of Christ is at, at stake that everyone in this room grows. I, I just have a passion that everyone sitting in here this morning will mature and grow up into the head because it's, it's all of our testimony to this world and to show the power of Almighty God. And so none left behind. It's all of us need to grow up into a mature uh, man because of all of our gifts working together. And then there's even a higher goal that will come about by those kind of people dwelling together in community. I've talked about it. I won't get lost in it. But uh, in Ephesians 3.10, that the church is the manifold wisdom of God, that we, we are put on this earth to show the world what God is doing and how he brought us together as one in him and where heaven is going, what it's going to look like when he sums up all things in Christ. We're that now from all tribes, tongues, nations. We've come together in unity and love and God's brought us and Christ is being worshipped and we're surrendering our lives to his lordship. And so the church is to show the world that picture. They will get it nowhere else. And so if we don't function rightly, we're, we're going to hurt the very design and the name of God to this world which is all of Scripture says that if that is done right, what will be the result is it will redound to the glory of God, which should be your chief end. All I exist for is that God would be glorified and made much of. So there's my incentive and motivation for this. It's not just that I'll grow. It's that God will get glory for this gorgeous, beautiful design of what he's doing in redemptive history. You with me? That's, your, that's not really your introduction's not over. I want to narrow in a little bit. That's God's design and goal of the church. So our second point then, that's just kind of Ephesians 1 comes before Ephesians 4. And now I want to come and look at the call to unity. <coughs> Ephesians 4, 3. Be diligent. I love that word. Diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Preserve it. Don't create it. It's already been created. The unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace came at salvation. This is done. We have it. We're joined to Christ. We have an amazing unity with anyone here who's a child of God this morning. You don't need to create it. It's already there. It's beautiful. And this is Paul's first command. Three chapters of doctrine. They're amazing. Live a life worthy then of this calling, therefore. And what should we do? He's going to take 16 verses to flush out 
what we should do with our unity. He's going to spend more time on it than marriage, than on parenting, than on spiritual warfare, than fighting for your purity. The longest part of Paul's epistle and application is to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. You think it matters. Right out of the gate, first thing, be diligent to preserve this child of God because of the salvation that you have received. And I just think this falls way too lightly on the church of God today. Way too lightly. This is the passion and the will of God. There's so much at stake in the preservation of this unity so that the church functions and works and proclaims to the world the way God designed it for His glory. There is so much at stake that we obey this command as the people of God. And when someone thinks of growing in holiness, this one never makes the books or or the seminars, does it? What's the last seminar you went to on this? This this is the first thing out of the gate for the Apostle Paul. It's God's concern. It's Paul's concern. This is it that we preserve the unity of the Spirit. And this matters because it's the way to put on display the manifold wisdom of God. And it's essential if we cause each other to grow up and mature into Christ's likeness. So this is no small thing that Paul's talking about. And I can see why the enemy will spend so much time then trying to destroy it if this is the foundation for our growth. This is the place that our enemy will put much of his efforts. You break this down, and infants stay infants. The sin that will come out of the church of God will look more like the gates of hell than the gates of heaven if this is not done rightly. Our gathering together will just cause more sin than sanctification if this isn't done right. God will get no glory from the church if we don't function the way he's designed it, which is happening all over in our day and age. And so I pray that if if you feel it and say it, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm going to share the day and age that we live in, okay? This is where the enemy's attacking. And what we're learning is if you feel something, you just say it, and you blast it on social media, a little battery on your shoulder going, I dare you to knock that off. And it has no ramifications, and you just walk away. The nastiness of politics has crossed a line that is just sickening. I I hate when a new election comes, because i got to watch everybody just slander and tear apart each other for months and months and months. And it's just crossed a line of just nastiness. And then we bring that spirit of the age into the church. My spiritual gift is speaking my mind. (laughs) That's not in Romans 12. Go read it. Critical spirit, divisive words. James says uh, these words can be a match that start a forest fire, and I'll just throw out matches all over the place. Doesn't matter. Jesus says you're going to stand before me and give an account for every careless word that you speak. And he loves his bride, and for you to take a match and keep throwing it at the bride of Christ, it's, it's just sin. It's brokenness. Jesus, uh, how about what, what you're saying about his own bride? That which he commanded us, the first application to live worthy is preserve the unity of the Spirit. And why does this not sit heavier than on our hearts? My sin to disturb this hurts not only me, but this body and our testimony to the world of God's manifold wisdom. So I, I pray that you will see how big this is that we maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And so my question is, why, why wouldn't somebody want unity? Why, why would anybody break something so beautiful? Why would you cross that or cause problems or throw little matches into it? Well, that's our third point. The barriers <coughs> to unity. The barriers to unity. It just seems so counterproductive. But the answer is so simple. There's something bigger in my heart than this unity. (laughs) Something like an epithumia, which means an over-desire for what I want. And so no one would want to break this unity. It's so beautiful what God has designed, but there's something that becomes bigger. And James says, what is the source of your quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not your epithumias that are causing all this conflict? I want this. Uh, I I want that. And it, it just takes over and it causes that to become bigger than the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And it could be uh, something like someone has hurt you and you nurse it and it grows until it gets bigger than the unity 
and I've got to slander them or I've got to make other people think less of them because of it. I've got to make sure everybody knows that I'm right. I've got to show my wisdom. Have any of you ever seen an armchair quarterback? Do you know that phrase? It's usually someone who's never played football, they're out of shape, and they're drinking beer for hours. And they know everything, and they sit and yell and say what the coach should have done and what the quarterback should have done, and they just go on and on. Well, I'm just telling you, they're armchair elders in the church of God who sit there that, that just know everything, <laughs> and you should do this, and you should do that, and they, they just spend their whole time as armchair elders. <laughs> uh, it could be, I don't get what I want. Uh, my gifts aren't being used, and we'll look at that in a second. Not working through difficulties. I, I think this is one of the most lost arts in our day and age, is we don't know how to work through conflicts, and we don't know how to go and share with one another and confront and talk back and forth. We just walk away. And so this is just a, this is a sin that's got to be repented of and, and changed. My own agenda. A root of bitterness that can spring up and defile many. I, I think uh, what I'm watching today is there's these blogs that are really good blogs and they're saying what the church should be and by the time you're done, it's heaven, okay? And then everyone's discontent saying, my church is in heaven. Guess what? Go read 1 Corinthians. Go read the New Testament. Every one of them were a mess. Till glory, we're going to be dealing with sin. And so we've we got to keep the bond of peace. And so hear what the Word of God is saying this morning. The first application of this great and marvelous gospel. It's to maintain the unity of the spirit of peace. You want to know the will of God for your life? Preserve it. and Keep it. And don't let anything become bigger in your heart and in your life than that. Love the bride of Christ and preserve this unity. Even when you feel wrong, shortcutted, hurt, whatever it is, there's something bigger than my own hurts. And it's this unity of the spirit that will show forth the manifold wisdom of God. Well, pastor, how do I do that with so many immature people? People who hurt me, I don't like the way they smell, I don't like the way they talk, I don't like how they act. How do I do it when I, I don't like what the elders are doing? I don't like the way the music is going. How do I, how do I keep unity of the Spirit with things like that? Well, that's our fourth point then, the remedies <coughs> to the unity. Look with me in Ephesians 4, verse 1. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Walk worthy of this gospel. How? With all humility. It is no longer about me, it is about Christ and His church. In gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance, forbearance for one another in love. Philippians, Paul says, let, let your forbearing spirit be known by all men. That's what we're to be known by is a, a gracious forbearing when people wrong me and hurt me. I've told you before, there was a guy named Thomas Cramner, a Puritan, and it said, if you ever wanted a Cramner to do something kind for you, do him wrong. If you wronged Cramner, then he really loved you. That's forbearance. And so if this is ever going to work, because when you start living life together the way God's designed it, guess what? You're going to get hurt, your toes stepped on, offended. There are going to be things that are going to happen. And Paul is going to say, if you're going to keep this unity, you're going to walk in humility and gentleness and patience, tolerance with one another, and love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. And so that is the, the only way that this will ever work is if we're humble with each other and forbearing and we, we look past hurts and sins and warts. If, if you want to nurse them and own them, you will break the unity of the Spirit and your, your hurt will become bigger than what God is calling us to here this morning. If there needs to be repentance, go ahead in your own heart even right now if that's necessary. And then the worst thing is to train your kids up to learn how to slander and badmouth the body of Christ the lifeline that they're going to need to make it to glory. Fifthly, how do we get then to this unity? The way to unity is uh, we are one, and I'm just going to read verses 4 through 6. 
Whenever I have someone say, I just don't fit in, uh, you just don't understand the gospel. You do not understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is one body. We are the body of Christ. And there's one spirit, the spirit of God that indwells each and every one of us. Just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, we have the most amazing hope of where all this is going. We gather together to help each other get to this one hope. And we're so unified because that's where our eyes are fixed. That's where we're running. That's where we're trying to help all of us get to. We have one Lord. I love you because we have one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of you who have faith in Him, we're just brothers and sisters. One Lord, we share Christ together. And we have one faith. We have the same faith and we have one baptism. One God and Father of all who's over all and through all and in all. One goal, the glory of Almighty God. We have everything in common. We need nothing else in common to have unity. Because we have that, it breaks down every wall, every barrier. If you have any barrier toward another believer in Christ, it's, it's just break it down right now in the gospel. It's gone. The walls of Jericho, boom, down. Well, how can we help each other? The world has tried for thousands of years. <clears throat> They've never gotten true unity. We've never worked together to make the world a better place. So how are we going to do it at Southside Bible Church? And by the way, you guys, so many of you are killing it in this area. You're doing awesome. So I just want to make sure you know that I'm so proud and blessed by what he's doing in so many lives. But there's some of you I just, I got to exhort this morning because you just won't do it. Okay, so if you're doing it going, why is he so impassioned and beating me over the head? Uh, you're doing great. <laughs> but some of you need beating over the head this morning. God, beat him. So the fruit of unity is in verse 7. But to each one, every believer, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so every one of you were given a spiritual gift. You were given a role that you would play in the body of Christ to help it grow. It, it, it is not humility to say, oh, I'm a nobody, I'm nothing, the church doesn't need me. That's not humility, that's sin. Every one of you have been given a gift by God to be used in this body in different ways of how when it all comes together, it's going to help us grow. Every one of you. And he says, if you sit and hide it on the last day, your little gifts, you're going to give an account to God. How did you use it? And so I just want you to see God in his love has given every believer a grace gift. And it was not given for you. It was given for the body of Christ to build it up. They're, they're not for you. Do you hear that? They're not for you. When your gift is for you, you just want to show what you can do and feel good about yourself. I can tell you this, if you have love for the body of Christ, you will have ministry. If you love this body because of what we are, ministry will just come and it follows a heart that loves. And if you have no love for the body of Christ, no matter how many times you get pushed, shoved, exhorted, showed the mercy of God in Christ, you just won't budge. I want you to see then how God has equipped his body. He's per perfectly designed it with gifts from himself that are needed for all of us to grow up into the head. That's a big deal. It really matters if we use them. And you're going to give an account for how you use them. So what is the purpose then of these gifts for us ministering to one another? In verse 11 through 13, I already read it. It's, it's that we would grow up into a mature man the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that we would become the fullness of Christ in this local assembly. And so everything done in the church, I want you to hear this, it's for spiritual maturity. It's to grow you up. And so we are all given to this project and to each other. I want to grow in Christ and I want you to grow in Christ. You can't look at anyone sitting here and not want them to grow in Christ. That's the new birth. I want every one of you to grow in Christ, nothing makes me happier when I hear a testimony that I've grown in Christ. We need each other. We need the church to not stay babies. It's here that we must grow up. Those who hold themselves outside of the community, they just don't grow the same way. 
They stay in the same sins almost all of their lives. We, we need each other. I can get alone with books and seek God and grow. But the way I grow, realizing, man, you say stupid things. You're always about yourself. All these sins that I'm battling come out in a body. And, the, and then someone gets to tell you things you had no clue. Have you ever heard yourself preach or speak on a recording? And you, you hear it and you're like, am I that nasally? And you're... <laughs> It's just like you don't see things about yourself until you know, it's brought out on a recording. And that's what the body of Christ is, is to show me things I can't even see in my own life. We need each other. That's how you're going to grow. And when someone starts to see your sin, don't pack up your bags and run. <laughs> Say, here, here, take the scalpel, put it in, and cut off the flesh. Don't say, no way. My pride isn't going to allow that. I'm out of here. Get in. And when it starts to hurt, people see your sin, stay and face it and grow together. I pray. So Paul tells us three marks of babies. In verse 14, he tells us we are no longer as to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the craftiness <clears throat> and deceitful scheming. So we're right back to those false teachers. And so uh, babies, we, we shouldn't be blown around. And I don't know if any of you have learned this, babies are not discerning. They, they'll eat poison. They'll eat bugs. And you can trick them. You, if they're crying, you pull a little rattle. Look at here. And, and they quit crying. And you can just trick them and deceive them and get them to do all kinds of things. Spiritual babies cannot tell truth from error. They just flip from one teaching to the next. Secondly, babies are self-centered. In Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, they break the unity real quick. You ever seen that? They cry and scream and steal and hit. I never taught my kids to steal, and they were getting cookies and stealing them at 18 months. They want what they want and when they want it. They have to grow and learn that there are other humans in this world, and it's just not all about them. And so we got to train them, and they got to grow up. And parents start saying, you got to share. You can't hit uh, Joshua. Spiritual babies, they're just always thinking about themselves. That's their focus. And it's so hard because this world and this church will never love you the way you want. You want to be the center of everything and it will never happen. And if so, you're a spiritual baby and you need to grow if all your center reference point is still you. You've got to grow. Thirdly, they're not steady. <clears throat> they have a very short attention span. They can focus for like 10 seconds on an object. And now, uh, give me something else. Church growth movement. I need this. I need that. Uh, give me this. Uh, you just keep looking for things, but spirituality is long obedience and a long direction. And you don't need new and exciting and fresh and change. You know what? Christ is enough. <laughs> Christ is enough to keep me maturing and journeying to glory. Give me Jesus. I hate to call people out, but Rick Hallahan, I've watched this man just stay in there and fight to serve Jesus Christ, know him, love him, and he just will not be moved away. That's what I'm talking about. The church is designed that we will grow. So I'm going to ask you this morning, are you growing? Are you growing? And I'll tell you this, the way you grow is not alone, but it's in community. Deep involvement and depth of relationship with vulnerability. It, it's, it, I got to open up. I got to fight sin with other people. I need help. I need community. I need one-on-ones. I need this stuff. And the devil's message will always be stay away, isolate, nurse your hurts, don't deal with them, and that'll never give God the glory that he's designed in his church. And so I pray, what does this look like day to day? Look with me in verse 15. The, the, the literal Greek is truthing in love. Speaking the truthing in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. So we are to speak truth and love into each other's lives. And it's becoming a, 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 just a forgotten reality in our society is you, you don't truth into each other's lives or you don't love and God's joined these two together, and the way this body is going to grow is that we keep speaking truth into each other's lives, but we do it in love. And I want to see you grow up into the head, and, and I'll speak truth, and we'll do it. And so we, we truth in love so that we could grow up into the head. And here's the last verse, our seventh point, the result of unity. 
And this is why I picked this passage this morning. So wake up. You ready? From whom? (laughs) Who's that? Christ. Christ is building his church. So from him is the source of everything. Everything comes from Christ. It's from him. We don't build his church. I told you before this Chinese missionary came to America and he went all over and looked at all the churches. And when he was leaving, they said, what do you think? He said, it's amazing what America has done without the Holy Spirit. It's amazing what you've built and your programs and your big churches. It's beautiful. It's amazing what you've done without God. (laughs) From whom? It's all from him. And now there's a subject and a verb with these participle phrases in between it. And I just want to look at the subject and the verb. The subject is the whole body. The whole body. That's the whole local assembly. And the verb, you have to jump down a little bit, causes the growth of the body. And so the whole body causes the growth of the body. And so the way you're going to, a normal body grows by a liver and blood flow and all these things. The whole body is what causes the growth of the body of a little infant. And now he's saying it's this whole body working together with all of our gifts, truthing and love that are going to build us up into the head. And so we, 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 we need all the gifts and it's each other. And, we, and that means you got to get into the body. you got to be plugged into each other's lives and, and getting in and caring and pouring and all of those things. And I need your gifts and you need mine. And it's just so codependent. I love it as we're dependent on Christ. But the way you grow the body causes the growth of the body. All of us. All of the gifts sitting here together, we need every one of them. If you are a pinky or a big toe, we need it. We need every gift. There's, I hate that when they say, that's a throwaway organ. Don't let them do that to you. It's a lie. Every organ you pretty much need. If you, if you had something taken out, I'm sorry. <laughs> but there's no such thing as a throwaway organ in the body of Christ. We need it all. We all need it to function. And so I pray that we would get this morning... God doesn't want unity just for the sake of unity. It's so that we will uh, be be in in these lives and connected and praying and teaching and truthing. And what will come about this with all of our gifts is we're going to grow up and we're going to mature and we're going to become like Jesus Christ. And then the manifold wisdom of God will just shine and the nations will see it and people will be gathered and brought into the kingdom. There's so much at stake. This is why Paul would park on it that we would maintain the unity of the Spirit. And I'm going to ask you, if, if you haven't been doing this because of your own agendas and your own hurts and all of those things and you've been throwing matches, I just, before God, I'm going to ask you to repent and obey this command for the glory of God. This is so important to your sanctification and to the, to the name of God. So, I got a whole bunch of application and I'm just going to skip it. Who's back there? Hi, if I step over here, will it make the... Okay. Application is I'm no longer preaching. <laughs> I just, as we close, what I, what I want to ask is that everyone would look here in the Word of God and you would look at the Gospel and you would live in a manner worthy of the calling that God has given to us. And that you would repent if you've been holding yourself outside the body of Christ and using excuses. Because love overcomes insecurities and fears and it keeps working at it and it digs in. And I just any excuse that you've been using, I want it to be repented of in front of God this morning. And to just go before God and say, I give myself to the bride of Christ. And the gifts that I have, I am going to find a way to dig in and know people, and pour them in, and pray, and be a part of this whole group that's going to look like Jesus Christ. And when that happens, uh, revival breaks out. And and I don't know if you've noticed in our last baptisms, like the last 10, it's a fruit of people beginning to see and and come in, and and they're they're seeing the kingdom of God. And there's a power to it. And so I'm I'm praying that every one of us would, would, would dig in by the power of Almighty God, abiding in Christ and His Spirit working through us to build each other up. And so it comes in community groups. It comes when you get in a community group. That's not the end goal. The end goal is what we just looked at. you got to be vulnerable. you got to open up. 
You've got to start inviting people to your home. Even if they turn you down, don't give up. Keep at it. Uh, discipleship. Older women, younger women, keep fighting, digging in, looking for ways. We're always trying to build the trellis, and then the vine can grow in. But it, it just all of us have to keep committing to this. And what will happen is God will get all the glory if we will all do this. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this beautiful passage. And I pray let no one hide from it right now. Don't let them hide under maybe 30 years of, of lies, 30 years of insecurities, 30 years of just patterns and habits, and really just a, a lack of love. God, let the love of Christ so overflow hearts this morning that we love one another with a love that comes from God. And we take our gifts and we want to jump in and use them not for ourselves, but for the good of these brothers and sisters to be built up into a mature man. Oh God, would you pour out your spirit and would you uh, just cause us to recommit and dedicate to this with all of our heart, mind, and soul and strength. God, I pray that it would be done in the power of Almighty God, that we would learn your resources to love one another in this way. And I pray that the baptismal would just blow open, Lord, with just we have to do them every Sunday because of the way your spirit is blowing. Oh God, meet us and work in our hearts here this morning, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.